worship. And it's not just for the food either. So, because I do love Chinese food. And we just, we don't get this good of Chinese food back where I come from. So it's good to be here. And we'll be number six in Genesis chapter one. We're partway through. Hopefully you won't get too long. Everything reproduces after their own kind. Creatures will adapt to the, that's to be and fill the earth. So creatures will change to fit different environments, but they will not change into a completely different kind. We've been talking about that. When we look at, look at the fossil record, we actually see the same thing in the fossil record. Here we have fossils of stromatolites. Now these stromatolites, according to evolution, I disagree with their information, but these fossils, or stromatolites were buried millions and billions of years ago. But yet these stromatolites in the fossil record look like the stromatolites we have today. So according to the fossil record, stromatolites, which are algae, have always been what? Algae, yes. Here's a fossil of a horseshoe crab. Now how can you tell that this is a horseshoe crab fossil? Because it looks like a, looks like a horseshoe crab today. Millions of years old, no hardly no change. Here's a bat fossil, or not a bat fossil, this one's a bat fossil. Now I get my fossils right. This, is, this bat fossil is supposed to be 50 million years old. How can you tell it's a bat fossil? Because it looks like a bat. Here's a wasp fossil. How can you tell it's a wasp? Looks like a wasp we have today. We find horse fossils. How can you tell it's a horse fossil? Looks like a horse. Oh, there's slight changes because to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. We see that. We see variations of horse fossils. We find variations of lemur fossils. We find variations of human fossils. But how can we tell them they're a horse or an elephant? Because they look like some of the creatures we have today. Now, we got some you know, clams here. These are the fossilized ones. They look like the ones we have today. Very little change. Same way here. Here's a fossilized leaf. It looks like the leaves we have today. Very little change. We find fossils of bacteria. How can we tell they're fossilized bacteria? Because they look like the bacteria we have today. Basically, we can identify them as bacteria today. Interesting. Yeah, things don't change. Things don't change from one creature to another kind of creature. Again, I've been repeating this over and over again. It's like a broken record. After his kind, after their kind, after his kind, and God saw it was good. This actually is scientifically true because it's been scientifically observ observational and experimental. Yes, everything reproduces after their own kind. They just adapt to their environment. It's not surprising because in Malachi 3, 6, God is saying... For I am the Lord, I change not. It's a good thing he doesn't change. God is not a capricious God. You can trust his promises. And he doesn't break his promises. Now, now just as God doesn't evolve into something else, neither does his creation. Now, now, again, everything reproduces after their own kind. Let's get into dinosaurs. Yes, God made the dinosaurs. And the question is, what day did God make the dinosaurs? He made everything in six days. So he had to make dinosaurs on one of these days, about 6,000 years ago. Day number six. As far as we know, dinosaurs are land animals, and he made the land animals on day six. So they were made with man. The flying reptiles and the marine reptiles were made one day before man, which means man and dinosaurs lived together in the past. Oh. People say, oh, these dinosaurs went extinct millions and millions of years ago. There's no science to that at all. There's a lot of science that prove, proves that they died just recently. In 1995, actually we have more information that goes back further than this, but in 1995 they found an upper leg bone of a T-Rex. That femur bone right here. Inside they found red blood cells still intact. Now, 2005 they found some more T-Rex bones. They found, again, red blood cells still intact. They found soft tissue. They found red blood cells or red blood vessels that were still elastic and they could still stretch them. Yes. And then in 2009, they found a hadrosaurus fossil, another dinosaur. They found soft tissue and they found proteins they could identify. Amazing. How many of you are in forensic science? Oh, okay. That's okay. <laughs> Never mind. Good. That's okay. Now, there's a new process now to tell how long a person's been dead. Just read about it just the other day. You know how they tell? By the deterioration of proteins. By checking proteins, they can tell how long ago a person died. So as soon as a person begin, dies, guess what happens to the proteins? They begin to deteriorate. Wow. They can still some identify some of these proteins. Is that amazing for 65 million years? Totally. Ah. Oh. They can identify them as collagen. This collagen is not found in bacteria, so we know it's not bacteria. We know now it's, it's dinosaur bone material. 
Yes, they dated some of us. I do have a problem with dating methods. But it does tell us one thing. If you find it in a bone, that means that creature died millions of years ago. It does tell us that. Well, the carbon-14 dated some of these bones. They discovered these creatures died about 10,000 to 50,000 years ago. Not millions. So carbon-14 dating, according to radiometric dating methods, dinosaurs did not die millions of years ago. Interesting. That means millions of years is all make-believe. No, it's not scientific. Bacteria. They found bacteria still alive over in Kansas. I was down in one of those mines. It's supposed to be 250 million years old, but it's still alive. That's a little bit of a problem when you study DNA. How they found hadrosaurus skin that's not totally fossilized. They're checking the DNA to see if they can tell what color skin dinosaurs were. Wow. Yeah. In a mosasaur that's supposed to have gone, been buried and died 80 million years ago, they found soft retina parts. What's retina? Eye parts. Does eyes last for millions of years? I used to farm. I've seen dead creatures. They don't last very long once they die. After a while, about a week, the soft tissue's all gone. Bones, after a few years, they're gone too. Wow. Yeah. Well, these creatures are buried in rock layers that are supposed to be 65 million years or older. I actually have an ammonite fossil, which is not even a fossil. It's not fossilized. It's supposed to have died about 40, 400 million years ago, but it is still shell material. It is not fossilized. It's still, you can see the color of the shell. Millions of years? Hundreds of millions of years? No way. Not according to science. So that means these millions of years must be what? There you go. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. You know, they get it right. They understand. The easiest people to teach are children. I mean, it is easy to teach children. They grasp it. You know, when I normally do this, most of the time when I teach Genesis, I teach in, in home Bible studies. I've got two of them going on in Grand Junction. I've got two different bi home Bible studies where I'm teaching Genesis. So they invite the whole family. I mean, they got little kids. Adults are asking questions. And you know who's answering the adults' questions? No, children are. I have no children grasp it. They, they just get this information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Erase the millions of years and add in the flood. Could stuff last four to five million years or four to five thousand years? Yeah, that, I don't have a problem with that. Millions of years? No way. We know through scientific research this stuff cannot last that long. That means dinosaurs did not die millions of years ago, did they? No way. That's great. Good enough. And that we have all kinds of evidence that dinosaurs and man live together. In Rome, they've got, in their Roman, ancient Roman mosaic art, they've got the dragons. This one here, you can't hardly see it. This is over at Natural Bridges National Monument. That's close to where I live. There's a creature etched in stone. Looks like a, a patasaurus. This comes from Mexico. This creature looks like a brachiosaurus. Yeah, he's got scales going down his back. I thought that was interesting when I was doing research on this. Because as far as we knew, no sauropods had scales down their back until we discovered some more fossils. Now they discover that some of these sauropods or dinosaurs had what we call conical scales down their back. How do they know what the pedosaurus looked like? They didn't have any fossils. Yeah. Here's a, another one. This is Inca stones. Rosettes on their scales here. I thought that was interesting until they discovered some more fossils of dinosaur skin. And now they discovered, yeah, dinosaurs actually had kind of rosettes on their scales. The rosettes are kind of set in a rosette formation. This one here is another ancient Mexican statue. This one here looks like a stegosaurus. Got some holes in the tail here. We believe there were sticks. We don't know for sure. How many of you are familiar with the stegosaurus? I'll use this big one right here. Two rows of parallel plates over the top of the back, right? This is wrong. We put them together in the incorrect way. They don't have two rows of parallel plates over the top of the back. With new research, with new fossil finds, they discovered just one row of plates right over the top of the backbone. That's how they looked. So when you see this in a museum, mistake, you guys put them together wrong. Yeah. I have a fun job. I get to play with my toys. Wow. Yeah. You've heard of hand-me-downs? I get hand-me-ups. I get my kids' toys. No. Yeah. I get to teach about them. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is from the museum near Grand Junction. They find just one row plates right over the top of the back. Well, not two, just one. How did these people know what the stegosaurus looked like? Fossils. No, they had no fossils. This creature has just one row of plates over the top of the back, just one row of plates over the top of the backbone. Isn't that interesting? They had no fossils. They got it right, we got fossils, we got it wrong. How do they know? Information's overwhelming that the ancient people lived with the dinosaurs. The Chinese people talk about dragons. Dragons are nothing more than dinosaurs. 
That's all they are. In Job 40, God talks about a creature called behemoth. He talks about, behold, behemoth, which I made with thee. So that means this strange creature lived with Job. He moves his tail like a cedar tree. Well, what do cedar trees look like? There's a cedar tree. How do cedar trees move in the wind? Like this. That's how a cedar tree moves. Very scientific. We'll talk about that. He's the chief of the ways of God. That means he's one of the largest land creatures that God has ever made. Now, some people will tell you that that behemoth's an elephant. Does that look like a cedar tree? Does it move like a cedar tree? No. no. Some will say, no, it's not an elephant. It's a hippo. Does that look like a... No. It doesn't even move like a cedar tree. But in the fossil record, they have huge creatures with huge tailbones. You put some muscle, some fat, some skin around those tailbones, you have a huge tail similar to this cedar tree right here. A few years ago, I was in the, doing a museum tour in Denver. They had a special exhibit on dinosaurs. And you know what they have now discovered? With new dinosaur finds, they discovered that some of these dinosaurs move their tails like this. They could not move them like this. They could only move them like this. Isn't that how a cedar tree moves in the wind? Good. Yeah, I'll have to take you along with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We knew about this thousands of years ago before they discovered that some of these dinosaurs move their tails like this. And I was taught that some of these sauropods couldn't eat grass because grass didn't evolve when the sauropods were here. No, well, the Bible says these creatures ate grass like an ox. You know what they discovered in the fossil record? These creatures ate grass like an ox. Interesting. How did they get them right? They lived with the dinosaurs. Yes. He was also the chief of the ways of God. They found the fossils of Seismosaurus. That's a pretty good-sized creature, isn't it? You compare this creature to this creature, which one of these two creatures look like the chief of the ways of God? He's got a big body with a big tail. There's a wimpy body with a wimpy tail. Elephants are not behemoths because they're too wimpy. They don't even fit the description. No. Knights in shining armor went off to go kill dragons. They described the creatures that they would kill, and guess what they described killing? Dinosaurs. Now, this is a dinosaur skull from the University of Wyoming. You see that skull? What does that skull look like? It's a dragon. Yes. You know what they call it? They call it Draco Rex Hogwartsia, which means the dragon kings of the Hogwarts. <laughs> that is a dragon skull if I ever saw one. You Chinese people were correct all along. <laughs> you know, I, was, I went out to Chinese dinner the other day, and they have these the, the 12 creatures, you know. All of those live, and then they get the dragon. Well, would the dragon be just a mythological creature if all these other ones really exist? You see what I mean? I'm looking for you. Your ancestors, they live with the dragons. Wow. It's not mythological, people. This is, these creatures really existed. Yeah. No. Oh. Dragons are really what? Dinosaurs. Yeah. Dino the word dinosaur is a fairly new word. But in the Bible, they talk, they, they called their dinosaurs dragons. Yes. And these creatures were huge. Some of these could look over a three-story building. Now, according to Scripture, God brought two of every kind of land animal up to Noah to put on board the ark. <laughs> so how did Noah get those huge beasts on board the ark? A lot of pushing and shoving. Is that how I got them in there? Big door, big bolt. Well, we don't know how big the door was, but we do know the bolt was big. Yes. But when we take a look at dinosaur eggs, dinosaur eggs are actually very small. These are all fossilized dinosaur eggs. Most of them were the size of melons. I've got a replica of an over-raptor egg right there. That's a dinosaur egg replica. Pretty small, isn't it? What you've been taught about over-raptors is not true. Over-raptors were supposed to be egg thieves. Raid and nest of protoceratops, that's all been proven false. You've got to watch out when you watch TV. You've got to be very careful. There's not a lot of science there. So they made a mistake on over-raptors. They weren't egg thieves after all. The smallest of the dinosaur eggs are about the size of a, rab a robin's egg. That's a pretty small egg. The largest ones are these right here. 18 or maybe 18 inches or maybe 30 at the very, very most. That's the largest of the dinosaur eggs. So this sauropod, that's probably about the size of a pretty good hatch dinosaur hatchling, about that size right there. Interesting. Not very big, was it? This is about the size of a, a stegosaurus, about that size. Not very big. This right here, this would be about the size of a unicorn when it hatched from the egg. There's your unicorn. The King James Version talks, goes into great length describing the unicorn. The unicorn is not a horse with a horn coming out of its forehead. 
This fits the description of a unicorn right there. What's that? Yeah, but they don't. This creature lived on land. Narwhals would live in the sea. Yes. This one fits very well. I go into more detail with my dinosaur program on unicorns. So how do these creatures get so big when they start out just this small? Actually, this is probably a pretty good sized stegosaurus. No. For, from being, uh, coming from one of these here anyway. Well, we gotta tell, go back to scripture. Go back to the flood. Before the flood, conditions were much different than they were today. Before the flood, with this water canopy, would cause a greenhouse effect. Lots of plants growing, lots of food for these creatures to eat. And in certain conditions, some of these reptiles grow faster than they do in the wild today. Now, reptiles have indeterminate growth. That means if you keep an alligator alive and keep feeding him, he gets, keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They don't stop growing. And some reptiles, like tortoises, can outlive man. Like, they can live to be two to 300 years old. So you take a look at this. Before the flood, man lived to be roughly 900 years old. Then the flood came along. I believe that water canopy collapsed, increased the radiation mutations. We don't live so long. We talked about that. But if you had a creature living before the flood, lots of plants to eat, good growing conditions, could outlive man, live to be 1,000 years old, could you get pretty good size? Yes. Well, not only do they find giant dinosaurs in the fossil record, they also find other creatures that were huge. Chamber nautilus today get about nine inches in diameter. The fossil record, they have found them up to nine feet in diameter. Now you all like spiders, right? This is, a, this is a Coloradoan spider. This is from eastern Colorado. It's about the size of my hand. That is not a big spider. This is a big spider. This is from the Denry Museum. There's the spider's head, there's his rear section, there's his legs, and there's a quarter to give it some size. Is that a big spider? No. That is a big spider. Now, you all like cockroaches, right? No. Do you have cockroaches here? No. no. Okay. This is my bathroom in Africa. They're about this big. We had to get mosquito nettings to keep our cockroaches off of us at night. They would run over our bodies at night. So we had to get, oh, doesn't that feel good? It scratched your back. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well. That's not a big cockroach. In the fossil record, they find them up to 18 inches in length. Ah, they're so big, you could use them as a piece of furniture. Yeah, wow. Birds were larger. Here's my wife, Sue, standing beside an elephant bird. Yeah, here's an elephant bird egg next to, you know, this egg was larger than many dinosaur eggs. Sea turtles were larger. Here's my wife, Sue, beside a giant fossilized sea turtle. As far as we know, they don't get that big anymore. You know, crocodiles, 40 feet long, heads longer than my body. How would you like to come a cup across a snake that size? You'd just be snack. Yeah. Snakes were larger in the past, huge snakes. Yes, mammals were larger, 19 feet at the shoulder. Here's my wife, standing beside this hornless rhino. Wow. Yeah. Beavers, from the tip of the tail to the tip of the nose, some of these were eight to eight and a half feet in length. If a beaver that size come up to your door and wants that tree in your front yard, my advice is give it to them. You don't argue with teeth like that. You know, creatures were huge in the past. Yes. But again, no one wouldn't have brought those old beasts on board. Those big dinosaurs were probably very, very old. They probably weren't even reproducing anymore. He would have brought juveniles. He probably brought dinosaurs on board maybe about this size. Because remember, these creatures were on the ark for over a year. You do not want to bring in sexually mature creatures on board the ark. You want them sexually mature after you kick them off the ark. Because they've got to reproduce their kind. Yes. And not all dinosaurs were huge. Some were only the size of chickens. No, very small. Now let's talk about man. No, I'm getting closer to the end here. Good. <laughs> Maybe we will get a little bit of Genesis chapter 2. Yeah. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So now we're going to take a look at man. Yes, and I like to look at my grandchildren. They're special. These are just few of them. I've got eight right now. By the end of May, I will have ten. Oh, I can't wait. You know, children are a blessing. They are. And teenagers are an extreme blessing. <laughs> they really are. I, people just think teenagers are just, oh, they get teenagers, they just lock them up in the door and shut, throw away the key. That's not the way it was. When my kids became teenagers, that's when I could really have fun with them. 
really, the best years I had with my children is when they were teenagers. Isn't that interesting? By the time they got to be teenagers, I had them trained, and then we were ready to have fun. So teenage years are good years. I love the teenage years. Yeah. And one of the things is I like to go hunting. So if I go hunting, I shoot him, I can have my teenage son, he can gut them. <laughs> That's a big advantage to have teenagers. The more of them, the better. Yeah. Teenagers are great. I love them. Yeah. But I really love grandchildren. They're fun. That's, and they're special. They're not just not by chance an accident. Yes. See, humans are made up of proteins, and we get the information from proteins from DNA. Oh. So DNA is information, just like the letters of an alphabet. By rearranging the letters of an alphabet in an orderly fashion, you get information. By rearranging the dot and a dash in an orderly fashion with the Morse code, you get information. By rearranging a one and a zero in a computer code, you get information, right, people? You have to do it in a very orderly fashion, right? You just can't throw the numbers in there, right? Everything has to be very orderly. Same way with DNA, with a, or, with a orderly fashion of rearranging four nucleotide bases, you get all kinds of genetic information. And according to research, information only comes from an intelligent being. Doesn't intelligent beings make computers? Is that right? Or Morse codes? Or write books? We know scientifically that information will only come from an intelligent being. Yes, it does not come from non-intelligent sources. So again, by just rearranging these four nucleotide bases, you get all the information to make plants, animals, and also man. The DNA chromosome, there are some of the most complex molecules in the whole universe. DNA is very, very complex, extremely. I've got another one program called The Mysteries of Life's Origin. We go into the complexity of DNA, and we're just scratching the surface. It is extremely complex. Yes, one pinhead of DNA is equal to two million times the information content of a two terabyte hard drive. Did you know that? And this is probably already outdated. The more and more we know about DNA, the more incredible it becomes. Wow. What about junk DNA? There's no such thing as junk. God doesn't make junk. You're not junk. Everything has a purpose. We need, we need to explore junk DNA and find out why God put it there in the first place. And guess what? We don't have junk DNA. It's all functional. You're, you're a human because of this junk DNA. Did you know that? Wow. But it's not junk. It's regulatory DNA. It's incredible complex. Now, this is a chart right here. This is, a, this is the chemistry taking place in your cells right now. This is taking place. All this stuff's going on. Here's another chart. This is all taking place. All these chemical reactions are taking place in your cells right now. Now, I'm going to take a close look at this little square here. We'll blow it up. You see these little green words here? These little green words are enzymes, they're proteins. These, these help, they're catalysts, they help with the chemical reactions. According to research, according to what we know about chemistry and so on, we can't get one of those enzymes by chance and accident. It won't happen. Somebody's gonna make those enzymes. Interesting. You've got hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of these proteins in your body and you can't get one by chance and accident. It will not happen. We know that scientifically. Oh, here's another chart. Here's another, these are all these chemical reactions taking place in your body right now. Here's another one right here. You didn't know you were so complex, did you? And this is probably already outdated. I mean, the more and more we understand the cells, the more and more we understand you are more complex than you think you are. Whoever, did, whoever went through all this work to make you, should he love you? Does he want to communicate with you? Yes. That's why what I teach, I believe, is so important because if we reject Genesis, we'll probably reject the Bible. And if we reject the Bible, we will reject the message of salvation. And if we reject salvation, what will happen to us when we die? God cannot bear that. He weeps when people reject his plan of salvation. He weeps. Because he loves every one of us very, very much. Because he went through a lot of work to make us. We have, the average adult has about 60 trillion cells. There's about, there's 10 million chemical reactions taking place per second per cell. Is that a lot of chemical reactions taking place? Yeah. Whoa, did that happen by chance and accident? No way. There is no way this could happen by chance and accident. 
It defies logic and science. Our DNA is a book of information. Some of our proteins are machines. You know you got motors in your cells? They're spinning and making ATP, and you got, motor, you got machines that transport things from one place to another cell, and they're doing all, it is crazy what's happening in your cells. And you don't even have to think about it, do you? It's all programmed. Wow. God is omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. God is very intelligent and powerful, so it's no surprise his co creation is very what? Complex. Thank you. Complex. I was always taught that life was simple because evolution is dumb. You know, you know dirt is, there's no intelligence, so life had to be very simple. Just blob of protoplasm. That was all false. They should have started right from the beginning. God made us. God made the cell. That means it has to be extremely complex. And guess what? It's extremely complex, even bacteria. Oh. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Jesus Christ is saying that. That means, has heaven and earth passed away yet? That means none of God's words have passed away. I've got all of God's words right from the beginning. They're right there in my Bible. Also, God says he will magnify his word above his name. Why does God magnify his word above his name? Because how do we really know who God is? Nature tells us some information about God, but how do we really understand who God is? Through his word. If his word is corrupted, his name is mud. Does God preserve his word? Does he have the power and the intelligence to preserve his word? That is not a problem, thank you. Yes. When I read the Bible, I know it's true. From one to the end. It's all true. There are no mistakes in the Bible. Did you know that? Just lack of human wisdom. wisdom. Right. Yeah. Now, God, let's say, let's make man in our image and so on. Let them have dominion over the fish, the fowl, the cattle, and all the earth. This word dominion means ruler. So Adam was given the authority to rule the material kingdom. Adam was king. That is very important to understand when we get to Genesis chapter 3, which we will not do this weekend. I'm hoping to get to Genesis chapter 2. Yes, so Adam is made king, and his wife is to rule with them. Yes. Again, God in the sovereignty ordained Adam king over his material creation. He's just king over his material creation, not over the spiritual. God is king of kings. Yes. Adam is a king with a kingdom, and the woman is ruled with him. That's very important when we get into Genesis chapter 3. Yes. And again, God repeats himself in verse 28, that man is to subdue the earth and have dominion over the fish, the sea, the fowl, and all the earth. That means man is to have dominion. But there's something wrong. Something went wrong in Genesis 3. We'll talk about that. Not this weekend. God, by making Adam king, has given him accountability and responsibility. Has he not? Yes, he has. Do we have accountability? Do we have responsibility? Yeah, we're accountable to God for what we do and say. God had, did not make pro, or robots. God gave us a brain, and he, he expects us to use it. Yes, he's given us a free will to make decisions. Oh. Look, whosoever, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Yes. As a father, he's given me responsibilities. Am I accountable for the spiritual well-being of my family. Yes, I will stand before God and I will hold it, be accountable for teaching my family. I'm the pastor of my family. I need to teach my family. I need to protect my family. Yeah. God has given me responsibility and he's also given me accountability. Man is accountable before God for his actions. I was on a jury duty. They ask all these questions when they're picking out the jurors. One of the questions is that they kept asking over and over, is man accountable for his actions? You know what everybody said? Yes. This criminal is accountable for his actions. Are we accountable for our actions? No, we are. No. And God created. Here we have this word create again. This is the third time we had it. We had it in verse 1. We had it with the animals. And now God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now that means God created something new that animals and plants don't have. What do 
man has, what do humans have that animals and plants don't have? A spirit. God is spirit, and we're created in his image. That means humans have a spirit, which means humans are not animals, are we? No. No. If we teach children that they're only animals, how are they going to act? Like animals. We're not animals. We're made in his image. God is holy, so how should we be acting? Holy. Does it make a difference what we teach our children? You better believe it does. Totally. God is a spirit, and God created a spirit for mankind. Yeah, so, talks about in Hebrews, talks about a soul and spirit. There is a soul and there is a spirit. They're very intertwined, but they are actually two things. Yes. So there is a human being, a man is, has a body, he has a soul or mind, and a spirit. A man is actually three in one. We are a type of a trinity. So to be a human being, you need body, soul, mind, and spirit. Guess what God is? He's one, but he's also what? Three in one. We're made in his image. Animals are not made in God's image. Plants are not made in God's image. Angels are not made in God's image. Only we are made in God's image. So when we take a look at nature, I know God is one, but he's also more than one. Yes, thank you. Three in one. Plants, animals, again, they're not made in God's image. Only we are made in his image. Yes. You know, there's a spirit in Thessalonians. There's a spirit, soul, and body. Again, three in one. As we go on, verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. For you English students, what is us? Plural pronouns. God is speaking, and he is using plural pronouns. So what does that tell us about God? He is more than one. Yeah, plural pronouns. Then we go into Genesis 27. And so God created man in his image. He created he, him, and male and female created he, them. Now we're using singular proteins for proton, or no, oh, come on, pronouns. English was not my strong point, by the way. Uh, get out of the science area. Singular pronouns. In one verse, God used plural pronouns to talk about himself, and then the next verse, he used singular pronouns. Does this guy have a split personality or what? Interesting. That means God is one, but he's also what? More than one. The true God of the universe is one, but he's also more than one. That's how you identify the true God of the universe. False gods are only one. Those are actually angels. Angels are one, not three in one. Only God is three in one. Again, God is one, but he's also more than one. We look at 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There's the true God. That's how you can recognize a false religion from a true religion, because if their God is not one, if their God is not three, three in one, that's a false God. Many gods are only one. If they're one, that means they're an angel. And if they want to be worshipped, that means they're a demonic angel. Interesting. Wow. Now, he created. Which means both the man and the woman are created in God's image. Scripture teaches man and the woman are equal. Women, if you want to have equal to the man, it's vitally that the Bible is taught. The only place we get women to be equal with men is in Scripture. Did you know that? Because we're both made in the image of God. So when you get away with Scripture, it's bad news for the women. Did you know it? No. But we do have different roles. See, we're both equal in God's eyes, but God has given the man one role, and he's given the woman the other role. So it's very important that we work in our roles. If we don't work in our roles, families don't function very well. We talked about that a little bit last night. Yes. So both the man and the woman are created in God's image, and we are, God is holy, he's righteous and perfect, so the man was also created holy, righteous, and perfect. There was no genetic defense, defects. So the original plan was that man would be what? Holy, righteous, and perfect. Is there something wrong? Are we holy, righteous, and perfect today? No, that means something's got to be done about it to make us again holy, righteous, and perfect. And Christ took care of that. No. So man is created by a loving God, so man has value. Do you know you have value? 
Somebody loves you, that means you're very valuable. This somebody who loves you died for you, so do you have extreme value if this person died for you? You just don't, you don't realize how valuable you are to somebody in this universe. That means life has meaning. Does life have meaning? According to scripture, it does. Your life has meaning. Your life has purpose. Yes. What about all the different colored people in the world? If we all go back to one man and one woman, how do we explain this? You know, we got white people, we got black people, we got red people, we got yellow people. What color was Adam and Eve? Were they white, were they black, or were they striped like zebras? You, you see all these people? All these people in the world are the same color. There are no two different colored people in the world. See, in our skin, there are cells called melanocytes. In melanocytes, there's, a, there's melanin. Now, melanin can come in two different pigments, a dark brown or pale red or yellowish pigment. If you have the genetics to produce a lot of this pigment in your melanin and your melanocytes, you're black. If you have the genetics just to produce a little bit of this pigment in your melanin, you're white. If you're brown, you're someplace in between. And there are some people who look a little yellow. Why? On our skin, there's a protein called elastin. This elastin has a little yellowish tint. Now, everybody produces it, but some people have the genetics to produce more of it than others. So if you look a little yellow, you just produce a lot of this elastin on your skin. That's all. Well, there's some people that look a little red. Why? I've got some friends in Wyoming. They are part Native American Indian. When they tan, they do not tan brown. They actually tan red. That's just how they tan. They're not sunburned. They look like they're sunburned, but that's, they just, that's the way they tan. Now, there's some people who have red hair. I don't see too many redheads in this group. But why do some people have red hair? Well, in this melanin, there's this other pigment, this pale red pigment. People who have red hair produce a bunch of this pigment. People who have red hair, not always, but normally, have a tough time sun tanning. They usually burn in the sun. Why? This pigment is the one used for tanning. If you've got a lot of red in your melanin, you have a tough time producing this, and so many redheads, especially if they have green or blue eyes, they burn in the sun. And I like to ask redheads, when you go out in the sun, do you burn? The vast majority say yes, they, they will burn. Yes. So I always like to pick on redheads. Yeah. But what about eye shape? You know, we got all different types of eye shape, even in this room. Why do some people have a more round eye like the Caucasians? Some have more of an almond-shaped eye or slit than the Asians. It all deals with genetics. Everybody produces fat around the eye. Everybody does. Some people have the genetics to produce more fat around the eye than others. So if you produce more fat around the eye, you have more of an almond-shaped eye. It's all in genetics. With Punnick Square, with the right combination of genes, you can get black people to white people or any shade in between if you have the right combination of genes. Does this actually happen? Oh, yeah. This is over in England. Black mother and white father had twins. One was black, one was white. One generation. This happened, I think, in 2005. These two, these two parents had white mothers and black fathers. They had twins. One was black with black eyes, black hair. The other one was white with white blonde hair with blue eyes. Can you imagine the looks that they got when they went to the store and said, oh, these are our twins? <laughs> no. This is another group. This guy's white. This gal was from Jamaica. She had a white mother, I think it was. There's one of their daughters, redhead. I think light skin, looks like she's got blue eyes. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Right there, these are twins. Wow, isn't that interesting? Here's another picture of them. There she is there. There's the... Right, these, there's the twins, this one and this one. Look at the rest of the family. There's the mom. And then she comes along. Wow. They can't believe that she's with the rest of the family. Everybody in the world goes back to one man and one woman. Did you know that? Did you know we're all distant cousins? Boy, imagine the family re reunion we could have. Wow. You go back far enough? And the God said to be fruitful and multiply and replenish. This re word replenish doesn't mean refill. It means to fill. God wants us to fill the earth with people. God loves children. God loves people. Yes. Where does racism come from? You know the Bible doesn't know of racism? According to scripture, there's only one race, and that's the human race. If you understand the problems in the United States, it's with the whole thing with the police and the blacks and all that, that's all based on evolution. Did you know that? Based on racism. Racism is an evolutionary concept. You've got to go to Darwin's book. People don't realize this. The origin of species, a lot of people know this title by means of natural selection. Well, natural selection is a disaster for evolution, by the way, we talk about that. 
What's the subtitle to it? The preservation of favorite what? Races. Wow, is that bad news? What a, this is a fraud. This is false science because true, true science in the Bible says there's only one human race. Yeah. Whole thing of Nazi Germany. Did you know all that was built on evolution and racism? All of it was. This is the outcome of evolution. This is where it ends. Actually, it's going to get, it gets worse. If you read Revelation, it's going to get worse, people. Hitler was not a bad guy to compare to what the Antichrist is going to do. But he was really bad. Yes. This whole racism that we're involving upward and onward is not true. This is all a lie. I'll tell you another story. When do I need to quit? Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Another story. Do you like stories? Okay, good. This is a true story. We went to Tanzania. The whole purpose why we went to Tanzania is to teach the lecture Evolution, New Age, and other false religions. We went to Tanzania to teach about the demonic realm, because they live with the demonic realm over there with all the spirits and all the witchcraft and everything going over there. But when we first got to Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, our host pastor brought us into a, a room where they had all these TV reporters and newspaper reporters and radio, they had all these media people. They brought us in this room, it's about not quite as big as this, and they had all these people in there. And one guy raised his hand and he said, why are you here? Why did you come to Dar es Salaam? So I stood up, I, it was, I was with my buddy Lanny, but I stood up and I said, if evolution is true, that means some people in this room are more evolved than others. There was only two white people in the whole room, Lanny and myself. Everybody else was black, I mean black, black. Then I said, if evolution is true, there was nothing wrong with slavery in America. Wow, it was quiet, not a word. Then I said, if creation is true, that means we all go back to one man and one woman, that means we're all related. There's only one race and we're all equal. And if we go back, if creation is true, that means slavery in America was wrong. That's all I said. That was the only question. I sat down. They asked no more questions. It was dead silent. The pastor got up and he started talking. And all of a sudden there was a big rumble in the back of the, in the group. I mean, this guy got up and he was mad. And so this pastor and this guy, I mean, they were in an argument just going back. and You know, it wasn't being translated, so Lanny and I, we didn't know what was going on. And so then all of a sudden settled down. They both sat down and then the pastor looked at it and he said, that guy was a Muslim. He said, the pastor was giving, a, giving our itinerary, where we're we going to be speaking in Africa. The guy back there, that Muslim, said, you are only going to teach in Christian churches. We Muslims also need to hear this information. Wow. Did they understand? They got it. They understood the importance of believing in creation. They got it. And that's all I had to do. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Wow. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts was darkened. darkened. That's right. Yeah. Adolf Hitler. Some of his quotes. If you tell a lie long enough, loud enough, and often enough, the people will believe it. Did you know that? People are more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. Did you know that? Interesting. Once you reject the truth of Scripture, all there is to believe in is a what? Once you fall for one lie, you can, any lies you'll fall for. Anything. Yes. Then we go on. Plants. As we go into Genesis 129, God created plants and plants were supposed to eat. According to Scripture, everybody in the beginning was a vegetarian. Nobody ate meat in the beginning. Yes. And it goes on, it's repeated. He made plants for meat or for food, so all the animals and people in the beginning always only ate just plants. There was no death. But what do you do with teeth? Some of these creatures had huge teeth. You know, I've got a replica of a T-Rex tooth right here. This is just the top portion. From the tip of the tooth to the tip of the root, some of these were 9 to 12 inches in length. Is that a pretty good-sized tooth? This is a replica of a T-Rex brain cavity right there. Now, he had a head the size of my body. That's the size of his brain cavity. 
So if you take the whole tooth with the root on it, do you know some of his teeth were actually larger than his brain? Is that a scary thought? It's probably why we don't see too many T-Rexes alive today. Yeah, 40 to 40 feet, 5 feet long, there's his brain. Stegosaurus, up to 30 feet long. This laser pointer rep represents his brain. That's the size of his brain. This guy's 30 feet long. Wow. Not a very bright creature, right? Doesn't mean he's completely stupid. But in the beginning, everything ate plants. Adam didn't have to worry about being eaten by a T-Rex, did he? Everything ate plants. That means there has to be another interpretation of sharp teeth than, other than eating meat, and there is. Here's a creature's skull. Here's his teeth. Virtually all of his teeth are sharp. Question is, what did he use these teeth for? Well, the question is, what creature does his skull teeth belong to? A lot of people say velociraptor, dogs, or whatever. Well, they, blink, they belong to a fruit bat. And guess what fruit bats eat with those sharp teeth? Fruit. Yeah, this is not a trick question. They eat fruit. Then down in South America, you have spider monkeys. And guess what spider monkeys eat with those teeth? Fruit. Yeah, this is a trick question. They don't eat, they don't eat spiders. They eat fruit. Yes, pandas have sharp teeth. Do they eat meat? Bamboo. Is it good to have sharp teeth if you're going to eat tough grass like bamboo? Yeah. There's a creature alive today. He has four sharp fangs. The question is, what does he use his fangs for? How many of you think he eats meat with his fangs? Looks like you're on. How many of you think he eats plants with his teeth? Now, how many of you don't think at all? <laughs> We've got some non-thinkers here. That's OK. Not a problem. Yeah. Well, this creature does not eat with his teeth. This is, these teeth belong to a nectar-feeding bat. He drinks up nectar with his tongue. So the question is, what does he do with his teeth? You know what he does with his teeth? He combs his hair with his teeth. What, what are these long things called? They're called what? Are they pretty good for combing hair? They're really good for combing what's left of my hair. I mean, that thing just glides through. Yeah. See, if you were a paleontologist and you were chipping in a rock layer, you, decided, you find these four sharp fangs, you would assume that could be a ferocious meat-eating creature, and you would be 100% wrong. Science doesn't deal with speculation, does it? It deals with observational evidence. We've got to watch to see what that guy does with his teeth. Did you know evolution is all speculation? We've never seen dead things evolving into living things, so they're speculating that it'll happen. We've never seen one kind of creature change into a completely different kind of creature. They're speculating that it'll happen over millions of years. Wow. And according to prophecy, the wolf is going to lie down with the lamb. He's not going to eat the lamb. He's going to eat with the lamb. I used to farm. Lambs eat grass. Lion's going to eat straw. Everything's going to go back to what it really originally was designed to do, and that is to eat plants. Here's a picture of a 27-year-old dog. Is that an old dog? Take 27 times 6 or 7, you get him in human years. He hasn't eaten any meat in its life, and it's just fine. What do lions like to eat? Meat, not this one. You put any meat and blood in this lioness food, it will not eat it. It was raised from a little cub by a family. They only, gave, they only fed this lioness plant food. So guess what this lion likes to eat? Likes to eat his veggies. veggies. Eat your broccoli, it's good for you. Yeah. Yeah. If you have the right combination of plants, these creatures do not need to eat meat. See, before the flood, there was all kinds of good food. They didn't really need to eat meat. After the flood, things changed drastically. Yes. Again, these plants were for perfect nourishment to, for these creatures to live forever. Boy, I like to get sold to some of those plants. Yeah. Now, we won't jump over that. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That brings us up to the end of that end of day or day six. God is very good. So his creation was also created very good, including the serpent, Lucifer, and darkness. Everything was very good at the end of day number six. So when does Lucifer become evil? When does darkness become evil? When does the serpent become evil? Well, I'm going to have to come back to talk about that one. And that's in Genesis chapter 3. Yes. Now, at this time, there's no suffering. There's no death at all. Everything is very good. Wow. Yes. Now, Deuteronomy 32.4. This is God. God. He is the rock. His work is... Perfect. So when he got done at, day, at the end of day number six, everything was very good and perfect. No mistakes. Yeah. Now we'll jump over that. That just goes into some of the words. And God saw everything that is, he had made, and behold, it was very good. And evening and the morning were the sixth day. And that then brings us into Genesis chapter 2. Looks like i got a few minutes here yet. I can jump into that if you're interested, or we can take some questions. 
Yes, that's, that was my thoughts also. Is there, are there any questions? No questions? Yes. No. According to scripture, it's going to be seasons are going to continue on. There's going to be night and day. Everything's going to continue on to the end. The whole global warming thing is I used to farm. Understanding the weather was my job. Okay? Because weather affects plants. And if you affect plants, you affect my profits. Okay? Are you with me? We always had change in weather. There was never two years exactly the same. That was a struggle in farming because never th everything was, the weather's always constantly changing. We had one year where we had so much rain and so much clouds. I think it was in 1993, we had a crop failure. That was my worst crop failure. It was worse than a drought because just my fields all flooded out. We had farmers just come in with disc and just disc everything. There was nothing there because too much rain, too many clouds. It was cruel, too cruel. Yes. When I was farming back in the 1970s and 80s, you know what the big scare was back in the 1970s and 80s? She, the question was, what about coal, coal or global warming or whatever? You know, how does that fit into scripture? Any of you know what was the big scare back in the 1970s and 80s? Global cooling. If we don't do something about human pollution, we're going to go into an ice age. And when I'm looking at this research they use, you know, there's a thing in science. If you torture the data long enough, you can make it confess to anything. And I'm looking at their research. You know what they do? A lot of them start in the 1970s and 80s. Oh, yeah, it was going like this, and they go like this. Well, don't start here. Let's go down here. Yeah. And then I was talking to a guy that does, does like with these weather stations and stuff. When one of these thermometers burn out, they've got to put another one in. Those thermometers always don't use the same temperatures. He said that. Sometimes they can be a whole degree or four degrees off, so they have to throw that one out and get another one in. Isn't that interesting? Now we got more concrete. What does concrete do to temperatures? The increase, yeah. You know, when I was a farmer, you know what we watched to understand climate change? The sun. The sun changed our weather. Human pollution, CO2? I mean, one volcano gives off more pollution than all of human history and their pollution. Did you know that? I mean... I was told, I was teaching in, Salt, or in Lake City, Colorado. I was doing a presentation. There was a guy that worked for DuPont. There was a whole scare about refrigerant 12, about ozone layer, all the joke. He said, if you want to understand what's going on, you follow the money trail. Yes, that's what he said. If you want to understand the whole thing with the refrigerant, you follow. I guess according to what he was saying was DuPont had the patents on refrigerant 12. Refrigerant 12, the patents were running out, so they had a big scare to get rid of refrigerant 12 so they could make a new patent on a new refrigerant so the bucks can keep still coming in. DDT, I was kind of doing some research on that. Looks like that's a fraud. Just the whole, they, no, I used to raise chickens. They have good hard eggs. You know what you need to feed your chickens? Calcium. In the research, they decrease, decrease the calcium. When you decrease the calcium, you get soft shells. Isn't that interesting? Wow. I mean, it's a track record. That's what it is. And so we have increases in sunspots, you have an increase in temperature. If you have a decrease, you have a decrease in temperature, something like that. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So somebody's making a lot of bucks off of you. Did you know that? I mean, somebody's making a lot of money. Wow. CO2 is plant food. It's a good thing. Without CO2, we don't eat. The more CO2, you know, these people talk about plants. If you breathe on, talk to plants, they'll grow better. They don't care about, they're not listening to you. You know what they like? <sighs> that CO2 you breathe out. <laughs> No, oh, it makes everything, so for a farmer, CO2 is good. It makes my plants grow more efficient. That means I make more money. You see what I mean? And that means you get more food to eat. Yeah. Now, do we need to be good stewards? Yes, we do need to be good stewards. I'm all for that. But we don't worship nature. Because what's going to happen is, I've been to other countries. Other countries need cheap energy. Because what in, over in India, you know what they cook? Cow dung. It is terrible for their lives. Smelling in this cow dung. What they need is cheap energy. And you know what global warming would do? Reduce cheap energy. So people will get sick, people will die. It's one of the reasons why I'm just against global warming, that whole thing, is people die. I care about people more than I care about 
nature. But because I care about nature, God created nature. You see what I mean? God, God cares more about you than he does nature. Because have you ever read Revelation? What's he going to do to nature? I mean, every, trees and everything. I mean, he's going to kill creatures like crazy. So, but the people will not repent. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? And if you want to understand global warming, just read Revelation. It's going to get really, really hot. Yes. And we just go, Earth's always gone through cycles. We had the, we had the Ice Age. The question was the Ice Age. What brought us into a global freeze and what brought us into a global warming? Human pollution, right? A lot of humans back there during the Ice Age. They can't understand. The Bible has an answer to that one, but they do not. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Back in the 1300s, 14, they went into a mini Ice Age over in Europe. Did you know that? And then there was some time before that, they went into, it got really, really hot. According to some records, it was much, according to the fossil record, it was much warmer in the past than it is today. We're not going into global warming, we're going into a global war, cooling, according to the fossil record. Interesting. The question is, know the truth, and you won't be deceived by the lies. Yes, really. That's a, once you reject the truth, people fall for lies, because that's all they have to believe in. Yes. But we need to be good stewards. Yes. Yes. Um, settle. Settle. Oh. Oh, settled science. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's right. Settle or subtle science. Yeah. Yes, it's big time. Have you ever watched the movie by Ben Stein, No Intelligence Allowed? Where, I don't know if you've seen that, it's been out a few years ago where he does research about if you go against the evolutionary establishment, you lose your job and stuff. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're a creationist or an evolutionist, if you go against the, the evolutionary establishment or academia, you will lose your job. Like Halton Arp, he lost his job because he debunked the Big Bang in his research. Now he's over in Europe. There is no such thing as academic freedom. You told a line because we're not dealing with science here. If it was science, they would encourage all this information. Just, I mean, that's what science deals. Just give us information. Let's help, you know, come up with the truth by more and more information. They don't want that. A lot of stuff is censored. We've got a book back there, Censored Science. Maybe that'd be a good one to read. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it is. It's big time. It's, it's, it's politics. It really is. Yes. Okay, now, that question is going to bring us into a whole different realm. <laughs> what a, a lot of what I, when I'm dealing with the science, evolution, creation, that's just superficial. The question you just now released brings us into a whole different realm of information. I will not answer that question now. I do not have enough time. And I have to prepare you for what I'm going to tell you. Okay, that means... I've got to beg Pastor Kevin for me to come back <laughs> to tell you that information. Is that okay? Yes. Because I don't have enough time to go into the depth that I need to understand. There's more going on than what meets the eye. There really is. This is not a physical battle. It is a spiritual battle. There's nothing physical about it. It's all spiritual. And that, I'll have to take you deep into scripture, I mean extremely deep, and go detail by detail what is actually going on. Because the enemy is not the atheist. He's not the enemy. The humanists, the evolution, they are not the, they're not the enemy. God loves these people. He died for them. In my studies, they are victims. I look at them as victims. They need to know the truth. And when you look at these people as victims, your heart cries out for these people. I love these people. They need to know because they're not my enemy. I fight a deeper, greater foe. And that's where it's at. And that's another, that's another weekend. They go into that depth. Yes. Oh, the, the question is, do I think that dinosaurs are violent and fighting with humans? Not in the beginning. Okay? In the beginning, everything was very, very good. 
Everything ate plants, everything got to go along real well. Adam sinned, things began to change. Sin changed everything. By the time of Noah's flood, we do know that violent fill, violence filled the earth. Not only did man become violent, we also believe the animals followed suit, because we see that in the fossil record. But that was against God's will. That's not the plan. Everything was supposed to be harmony, getting along with each other. After the flood, then God said man could eat meat. So we don't have to be a vegetarian anymore. God has given that, that we could eat meat after the flood. So not a, now I used to live up in Minnesota. We have a deer population there. And if you go up to northern Minnesota, if you do not have wolves or have enough hunters to keep the deer population in check, they will overpopulate during the summertime, and then you have mass starvation in the wintertime. So we have to, as a hunter, as a hunter, I am really called a conservationist. That's, that's what I really am. I'm a conservationist. We, what they're doing is trying to keep elk herds at a certain population, because if they get too many elk, what happens? You got problems. You got diseases. You got starvation. That's the problem we had in Colorado, where they were not having enough hunters to hunt deer and so on, and they were having diseases. So we had to get the numbers down at a certain level so we don't have the disease problem. So I'm a conservationist. I'm really not a hunter. You see what I mean? Okay. Now, Nimrod was a mighty hunter. I mean, literally, he was a mighty hunter. What was the problem at Nimrod's day? Probably dinosaurs. They were raiding their gardens, and they looked terrible. And as a hunter, I like to shoot big animals. I don't want to shoot Bambies. The one, like the one with the bigger horns, that's the ones I hunt. Can you imagine a mount you could put on your wall if you shot a big T-Rex? Wow. Yeah. My son shot a six by seven elk. That elk head is so big, he didn't have enough room. And from the tip of the antlers to the bottom of the nose, it's six to seven feet. That means if you put it on a wall today, the whole wall is elk. So you look into his eyes instead of looking up in his nose. So I have a place in my house that's, that's actually two stories, so we put it in that place. Yeah, it was huge. Yeah. I'm glad he shot it, not me. It cost him over $1,000 to get it mounted. But I got it in my house. <laughs> I know how to run the system. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I said, yes. They started out very good. If you really want to understand dinosaurs, you know, you know what you want? You don't watch Jurassic Park. You don't get the truth. Under <laughs> if you really want to understand dinosaurs, you watch the Flintstones. They had it. I mean, those guys were close. <laughs> no. Yes. Any questions? More? Yes, right back here. I'll get yours. A little bit. 